Excellent. Yeah, well, we can make a start, I think. You want to make a start? So, yeah, let me introduce everybody and. Uh, Hello, Chris. Right, good morning, everybody. My name's Dave Smith, and I'm the host for this first session this morning. The session, of course, is going to be Nigel Payne out in sunny Slo uh, Slovakia, talking sunny about Slo talking about scratch building an NER locomotive. Um, before we start, there are one or two ground rules, which I'm afraid I'm going to have to uh, read to you. Um, the first is that this session, well, all the sessions today, in fact, are being recorded. Now, if anybody objects to their image being visible to everybody else in the recording, then you have the option to uh, turn your video off, which is by clicking the little picture of the camera down on the bottom left corner of your screen. Also, um, if there are any juveniles watching, um, you are deemed to have had parental consent to uh, allow yourselves to be recorded. Could I ask you all, before we start, please, to mute your microphones. Uh, this way it prevents any extraneous noise background noise, people coughing, doors slamming, doorbells ringing, dogs barking and the like, all of which are very distracting to the um, presenter. <coughs> Could cause Nigel to do a, make a severe mistake with his model making or burn his fingers on his soldering iron or whatever. Also, you'll find it convenient if you switch to speaker view. Now you do this by going, move, move to the little box marked view, which on my screen is at the top right hand corner. You click that, you'll see several options, one of which is speaker view. Now when you're on speaker view, then the person who is doing the speaking, he is, he is full screen. So it'll be easy for you to see what's going on. Otherwise, you're all in little pictures, you know, which um, might be a little bit difficult to see what, uh, what, what is actually doing. So we'll, we'll start. My name, by the way, is Dave Smith. And um, but for the fact that we have this unfortunate situation that affects all of us, um, today would have been the, the real spring show, Gage O'Guild spring show here in Kettering of which I am the show manager, of course, but um, we all know why that can't go on. So this is the, um, this is the virtual replacement for that show. Um, my co-host today is, is um, Charles, Charles Aldroyd. Where are you, Charles? Are you, give it a wave or there he is. So I'll now introduce you to our presenter, who is Nigel, Nigel Payne who will tell us all about what he's going to be doing. Oh, questions. If you want to ask any questions, um, you'll see that there is a chat facility down the bottom of your screen. There's a little little speech bubble with the word chat underneath it. Now, if you click on that, you can set, you can type a message which will appear on everybody's screen and um, so as not to distract Nigel whilst he's working, we will either Charles or myself will um, read out the question, which I'm sure Nigel will then be able to answer. Incidentally, if you want to, if, if you recognize somebody who's uh, a participant, participant and you want to send a private message to them, you can do so by clicking on their picture and sending them a, a private chat, which only you and they can see, but otherwise the, the remarks are visible to everybody. So, Nigel, over to you, and you can tell us all about what you're going to be doing this morning. I put it on mute, because I was drilling <laughs> <laughs> while, you were, while you were yakking away. Good morning, everybody. Morning, Dougie, 
from New Zealand. Morning, Mr. Allen and everybody else. Nice to see you all. Um, Morning, Nudge. Ah, there you go. Your dulcet tones, that's nice to hear. Um, Just quick, quick unmute there, I'll go back onto mute. <laughs> Jolly good. Have you got your, um, any of your Northeastern books there? Get back off mute. Nigel's asking, Dougie, if you've got any of your Northeastern books to hand. Yeah, I heard him. Right. Um, I will have to leave the session for approximately three minutes while I burn my fingers on the, on the stove while Jan is away, while I separate this. So uh, you, you can always talk a bit about Northeastern while I'm gone. <laughs> Anyway, um, good morning, everybody. I, last session was, when was it? Was that October? Though? Yes, it was October 31st. October the 31st, so that's two months, three, four, four months ago, isn't it? And we're still here, except rather than me being sat here in shorts in the sunny Slovakian weather, um, I've got a scene similar to Stephen Rogerson's with a big mountain in the background and snow outside. So uh, it's snowing today. It's very nice, very pretty. Um, last time I was building a North, uh, I said that again, a Czechoslovakian diesel rail car, um, which is currently residing at the local depot in Poprad, in the depot manager's office. So he's, he's got that sitting there and he's admiring it. Um, and Today I will be mainly building a, let's call it a Northeastern Railway locomotive. Um, however, it, its origins were from the Stockton and Darlington Railway. We, early this morning, Dave and I had the conversation about this because everybody thinks the Stockton and Darlington Railway basically had locomotion. And, uh, and that was all that it was about. And of course, like every other railway in the pre-pre-grouping times, um, it, um, it grew and it developed as did its technology. And in the 1860s, um, one of their, their chief engineer was a chap called Bush. And he was the brother of Bush of the Tay Bridge construction the first Taybridge construction, which uh, obviously uh, didn't do very well, um, fell down. His brother worked for the Stockton to Darlington Railway and he designed a series of locomotives, including a 440 um, loco, which was designed as a passenger, pa passenger locomotive, seven foot diameter driving wheels. I think they were three foot seven. Um, <laughs> Would you like me to put a picture up on the screen of it? Um, By all means, yes, why not? No, just so people can see what you're talking about. Yeah. Let's do that, shall we? Can everybody see that? Right, go to not that one. <laughs> Next one down. So that's it. So that's what uh, that's what Bush designed, and um, it's uh, interest interesting uh, interesting construction. the The main thing about the locomotive is it had a load of innovations in it. To the back of the locomotive, uh, underneath the uh, or, or just behind the steps, um, on the inside of the frames was a water tank which was used as part of the transfer of the water from the, uh, from the tender into the locomotive. Beneath the, or, or just in front of the front driving wheel in, in, in between the frames were two mechanical pumps, which were the, um, drove off the valve gear and pumped the water into the boiler as and when required. And the valves in the, the, the uh, the, the, in the in, in the um, God, my mind's gone blank. In the cylinder block, 
were of brass material. And if anybody knows anything about metals and how they expand and contract, and some of the people here know more about it than I do, um, they had all sorts of problems with the expansion of the brass valves inside the uh, in, inside the uh, the cylinders of the uh, inside the, the steam chest of the uh, um, of the loco, and it, because of all the problems, it got a nickname of Jinx's baby. And Jinx's Baby was a satirical novel written in 1870 by a chap called Graham, I think it was. Jenkins. Graham. No, I don't know where I got Graham from. Edward Jenkins. Um, and it's a satirical story about a child called Jinx, or the baby of the, of the, fa of the father called Jinx who had lots, of, lots and lots of problems. And they had lots and lots of problems with the design of this locomotive. Um, if you scroll up a bit, please, uh, Dave. To get the next thing here. Um, here's the elevation and plan from the locomotive magazine. Um, on the right hand side, have you got your cursor there, Dave? Mm -hmm. You take it to the, to the right hand side of the, of the screen, down a bit, it's like the golden shot this isn't it take it down yeah. there's a big open box there that big box or if you go up a bit you can see it in in profile uh, there that big open box that's the water that's the water tank and then running along beneath the uh beneath the firebox and in towards the center of the locomotive you'll see the pipe running and it goes to a pump which is up a bit there that's it so it's quite a novel design. The other, the other part of the design is that the um, uh, front bogey uh, has a cup design, which some people seem to think that it uh, it was was not connected to the locomotive any in any way. So basically, the the front bogey just just flopped around. I think there's actually a, a retaining, uh, should we call it retaining bracket or something. Um, at the top of that that U-shaped cup um, to, to hold the ball in place, but nevertheless it, it wobbled around. Um, this locomotive in question that I'm building was built in 1871. Sorry, 18, it began running in 1874. Um, so by that time, the Stockton Darlington Railway was part of the Northeastern Railway, and it was under the uh, the, the engineering department was under the, the charge of Fletcher Edward Fletcher, who decided that he didn't like it as running as a four four zero, and he got lots of nicer locomotives running. So he rebuilt it as this, da 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 da, um, and this is the model that. Oh, this is hopefully the model that I'm going to be building. Um, it's one of the, they were built in two batches. So the first batch was from 1871 to 1872, um, followed by a further batch built in 1874. This is of a later batch because it's got rather nice cutout splashes. If you saw the, the drawing of the one at the bottom, it's a bit boring. And I, this is what actually attracted me to the model in the first place. Um, I started building this model about 20 years ago um, when Dougie, who's on here, and I were, uh, were, were both living in Keithley. And Dougie, being the excellent engineer that he is, turned up some rather nice, here's a, some I prepared earlier. Want to go back onto the main screen, please, Dave? Da, 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 da. A very, very nice chimney and dome. So, what I uh, decided to do was to, I said that we started this 20 years ago, all sorts of things happened in the meantime. Um, And I was building this, which is, looks quite pretty. 
um, all sorts of issues with it. But uh, my my modeling skills hopefully have come on some in the last 20 years. Um, and I've decided to build it as a 240 um, rather than the 440 that you see there because um, it's more in keeping with the other models that I'm building at the, at the moment. So it would have run alongside my Northeastern Railway F-Class um, and all the various other bits and pieces that I have aspirations to build. Um, morning, Mr. Taylor, Robin Taylor, another one of the Keithy group. Robin and Dougie are the culprits of all this because if I wasn't, uh, if I wasn't involved with the Keithy 7mm group, I would be modeling probably Deltics still, but I'm not. I'm doing building Northeastern Railway stuff, uh, locos and the like. And uh, there's, a, there's a rake of wagons um, in front of the model of the Titanic for my son in the background there. So you can see that I've been done a lot of uh, Northeastern this year. Um, if you saw that photograph of the loco, um, as a 240 design, you'll notice that it is very intricately lined out. I'll not be doing that. That's going to Mr. Dunhill. Um, so one of the things I have to ensure for Mr. Dunhill is that this model is able to be dismantled into a state where he can actually get his bow pen in. So um, that is... N N Nigel, uh, a question which, well, you and I are discussed this recently and um yes it's the loco is a 240 indeed but is the front axle a rigid axle or it, or would it be on a radial radial axle boxes because it's certainly not a bogey uh, well a pony is it it's not a bogey i don't think it's i don't think it's a radial axle box um i had this conversation with somebody else was it you or was it you? Douglas? Probably was me actually, because I, I asked the question of you last time. Um, I don't think it was because I think it might have. When did radial axle boxes first come in? I don't know. I know Fletcher because one of the early Northeastern Railway designs was the A class. And uh, oh, Dougie's gone. Robin might be able to stick his thumb up. Is it, was the. Uh, did the did the A class two four two have radial axle boxes? Yeah, I can see a moustache going up and down. So, so, so I, maybe I, I don't know when radial axle boxes came in. I don't think it is, and I'm not building it as such. <laughs> so I'm building it as that. <laughs> so. It was around 1875, 1880 for radials. There you go. So this was 1874. Probably not Mr. Bush. Um, so going on to the model. There's no drawings for this. Well, the only drawing that there is is the one that you saw from the locomotive, which um, uh, which Dave put up on the screen. So, and um, there's no seven millimeter scale. Start drawing it. The, the top one is the is a seven millimeter drawing of the original. Uh, and that is a, as a 240. Final drawing shows a bit of the detail of the front, uh, how to get the cab right. Um, one of the biggest challenges I've got is if you look at the the wheel spacing, can't move my finger, there you go, is it's incredibly close. So um, I've actually had to ease, ease the, uh, the frames, the, the spacing of the, of the wheels out by a couple of mil so that the flanges from the, um, from the loco will not touch. 
Uh, as such, I went to, where the hell is it on? Doesn't matter. I spoke to, oh, here it is. I spoke to our friends at, uh, are you allowed to advertise on this? Premier Components. And, yeah. and he's made, made up some seven foot six plain coupling rods for me, which are a perfect match to the Jinx's baby. Well, to my Jinx's baby. Um, so it's a 52 millimeter centers on this. So I've, uh, I've purchased those. Um, I've, I've got a set of uh, Slater's wheels for it. Dougie's dome and chimney, which are craftsman built uh, and machines and everything else on this model, it will be, um, will, will have to be scratch built. So here's the, the running plate, all cut out and ready to go. First thing I did, because I like doing that, and I really wasn't going to write off 50 million um, uh, blades with my flat fret saw in front of 100 people watching this, and however many, many we've got here at the moment, 30. Um, but I, uh, I've cut this out uh, over, I think it actually only took me an evening to cut these out and, and tidy it all up. But this is the first assembly that I've made. But I thought, well, I should get on and and do the get the chassis, get rolling chassis done. Um, so it's a very constricted model, I must say. You know, there's there's no space. There's no space. There's modelers compromise, of course, because seven millimeter um, scale. Uh, the um, the back to backs are are not uh, as per the prototype. I'm not doing this in, in uh, scale seven. So I've had to make a compromise. The boiler is about a scale three inches um, narrow in diameter. It, it, it's four foot diameter on the, it's four foot diameter unlagged. So it should be four foot three. So I, basically, do you recognize that Robin? You gave this to me 20 years ago. <laughs> Here's the boiler. Um, Robin, Robin's dis disappeared. He's, he's got other things to do. He's got other things. He's got to prepare for his talk. He's doing a talk about build, building construction or cottages. Not cottaging, cottages. So uh, he's, he's doing that. Um, so this boiler, um, this isn't the boiler I'm going to be using, but, but, but the original boiler, but it's it's... 28 mil instead of 30 mil diameter. And as such, everything slots together quite nicely. But it's all, of course, a compromise. But, but looking down on the top of the old model, you can see how old it is. It's, it's definitely sort of oxidized somewhat. Um, that, that will uh, be what it will look like. Um, the, the locomotive was highly decorated. So the top surface of the splasher will be of brass and I'll have to make it so it can be polished up. Um, the same thing around the cabs, the, around the um, uh, sandboxes and everything. So it's, it's going to be an interesting, an interesting exercise, interesting model to do. Um, so when you're scratch building, um, you have to think a lot. <laughs> it's not like buying a, a nice DJH um, uh, um, kit where it's all done for you. I built a, a DJH um, Northeastern D class. Was it an A6, I think, in, uh, in LNER flavor? Uh, it's a 444, lovely loco. And I built it in about two and a half weeks, just fell together because it's a very well designed kit. Um, when you're scratch building, you have to think and uh, certainly gets the old grey matter going. Um, so I've drawn from all the experience that I've had from the last <coughs> years of building models and um, uh, taken, taken the tips I've learned from fellow Keithley 7mm group members, Dougie in New Zealand now, uh, Robin who is still in Keithley, um, and uh, drawn from their experience and started with the frames. So first thing I've done is 
Um, I like my frames to be reasonably chunky. Some, some are very, very flimsy. So this is made by, made of, it's nickel silver and two frames laminated together is just shy of two millimeters. So let's call it a one millimeter thick framing. So in, um, in, in real money, it's probably way over, way over size, probably double the size of what thickness of a frame in, in the, um, on the real thing, but you need some sort of strength. And as you can see, this thing isn't exactly the most, it looks fairly flimsy. Um, I've got a bit of a challenge here, which I discovered this morning. This is the rear driver. And if I make the bush, the bush fit in there, I think I'm gonna have a bit of fun. So I'm, I'm gonna to have to turn up a, um, get the lathe out. I get this in there, lucky, um, and turn up a, a, a or turn down this bush or turn up a new bush to uh, for the um, for the rear um, driver. Um, basically, I've taken two sheets of two sheets of, uh, of metal, cut them to the approximate size that I want, blathered the both of them with a load of solder. Well, not blathered, but done it nicely and, uh, and uh, sweated them together. So sweated them together. I've then gone to the photocopier, which we have. I photocopied this drawing here, or maybe this one. I can't remember which one I did. No, it'll be this one. Um, and cut, cut out the Photocopied it, not because <laughs> previous week I was scaling the uh, earlier on in the day I was scaling the the um, the drawings that I did have to seven millimeter, so I was messing around with the scale button on the on the photocopier. So then I, I copied the uh, the frames, photocopy, cut it out and laid it onto the the, what, the frame. And uh, it was too small. It was about uh, 10, 10 millimeters too short. And I thought, what the hell's going on here? I was going crazy. And then of course I realized that the settings on the photocopy were, were wrong and it was reducing the scale slightly. Um, so that was a bit silly. Um, I cut them out, cut out that, the, the thing from the photocopier, which luckily still retained its, um, its graph paper um, squares and stuck it onto a sheet of brass or two sheets of brass have been sweated together. I have then um, taken that brass and then got a fret saw, got a drill and I've got holes in it. I've drilled out where the axle will go. This, this, it's going to be compensated so the front, the, the, the front driver and the front um, uh, bogey, uh, pony it's 11 o'clock will uh, will will wobble up and down the rear one will be fixed um, and the way that I've designed it is that the here's something I prepared earlier actually 20 years old earlier um, is a Slater's axle box not axle box um, what do you call them on 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 guide and I've cut that out, cut the frame out, so that will now sit inside quite nicely. I've also designed it so that when it is sat flat, is that there is about half a millimeter only of vertical lift from the center of the, of the, um, uh, the, 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 axles, the axle center. So it will go down, but it won't go up very far. If I need it to go further, there is a little, there is a little pin thing here and I can file that up a bit. So I could get a little bit more height. Anybody input on that? I don't know. Do you think it should be, have a bit more up? Well, Dougie says you, no. You want the majority of the weight uh, on your driving wheels, obviously. So I, I take it the the pony wheel 
or pony axle is, is that not that's that won't be sprung will it not that is sprung it is sprung but um i haven't decided on the springiness or the strength of it but whatever um the, yeah i i wanted the front to be uh i wanted the front axle to 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 have some form of compensation there is a chance that it will dip is that what you're thinking dave hmm. i would i would think though nigel that given the the length and weight of train that this particular locomotive would have hauled that in model form um i don't what sort of weight it, it, is your loco going to be do you think no idea. As much as I can put in, probably. I mean, you're not, you're not put, going to be, put Mr. Hay on the line. You're not Maybe. going to be putting. You're not going to be pulling twelve bogey coaches with it, are you? I'd like to try. <laughs> Dougie, what's your thoughts on this? Because I was doing this last night, and um, this is my first two four zero. Would you compensate? Would you would you spring the fr the front pony, or would you have it solid? You, you can do either, really, but uh, a little bit of movement is good. Uh, the, the whole thing with the springing is to, is to keep the wheels in contact with the rail for pickup. Exactly. And, uh, you, don't need, you don't need a lot of movement. It's just a tiny amount you need just to keep the tyres in contact with the rail. Yeah. I personally have never built a 240. <laughs> so, you have either. You built that you, you hay. You built that for as far as I'm concerned. There, <laughs> right. So <laughs> the next two, next two locos I'm building. Well, this one and the next one are both two four O's. So I'm building a uh, building this, and I'm following on with a Waterbury, which is a lovely name for a loco. It just sounds really sort of uh, idyllic, and it's a little two four O, um, and. Uh, so I'm using this as the as the first attempt and see how it how it moves on from there. Um, uh, so I've cut this frame out using the uh, using the uh, graph paper method. It works really well. So if you are trying to scratch fill something and making two bits which are absolutely identical, um, do it that way. Um, you know, I had a whole load of them. You know, so, and, and the offcuts, I keep them because in case I've got to do anything else that's duplicated as well. So um, uh, I think it's I think it's quite a good idea. So that was a uh, Mr. Taylor, Robin Taylor's idea, um, but I'm sure it's been done for years and years and years. But uh, uh, that's what I that's what I do. Um, so the. Uh, Moving on with this, uh, I've now cut this out. This big lump at the top here is partly for strength. Um, if you look at the, what have I done with that splasher that I had? Put it down. There we go. If you look at this splasher, this would sit, oh, I can do this properly, can I? As we are at the moment, this is the assembly to date. It's a little bit tight, but it'll need fettling. So this will fit in like so. Obviously the chassis will, um, will be separate from the body and the splasher sits on something like that in front of it. And the boiler, can I do this one handed? Yes, I can. Obviously it sits behind there. Um, and the reason why the, this, the rear of this, uh, the rear splasher or the part of the frame is cut down like this is because the boiler will get in the way. Um, on the real thing, of course, there was a bit more space because the, um, the frame was further, was further apart, but you can't do that in seven mil. You can in scale seven, but you can't do it in, in, in fine scale. So um, I've done it. I've I've made it as made the frames as wide as I can, um, allowing for a little bit of slop in the wheels in the in the uh, in the axle, um, and um, yeah, so it'll go around corners. 
Um, so that's that's where I'm at. So this is going to sit on here. There's a big gap at the back where the boiler where the boiler the pot might even rest on that. So let's see, might give it a bit more strength when it's uh, when it's assembled. Um, but now that this is all drilled. I would ask you to talk amongst yourselves for a couple of minutes and I'm going to go to, my wife's just returned home, I feel really bad now, I was going to go to the cooker, to the gas hob and I'm going to split these. So can I hand over to Dave and, uh, and Douglas to talk, talk about me and say what a bad man I am and I'll be back in two ticks. Okay Nigel, um, I've just been, whilst Nigel was talking, I've just been googling uh, Northeastern 240 class locomotives and I've come up with a picture of one that's in the Shildon Museum uh, locomotive number 910 which is of the 901 class now I don't know whether Dougie whether you know was this a derivative of the of the class that Nigel's talking about if I get the picture up on the screen you can you can perhaps uh, have a look and tell me what you think. I'm, I'm fairly familiar with the 901 class. Uh, and there were all developments of one another. There were many, many locos of a similar, a similar nature, two photos, and they just developed one after the other. Can, can you see that picture, uh, everybody, or, well, Dougie in particular? Yeah, I can see it, yeah, yeah. yeah. Differs slightly from Nigel's version in that the splasher doesn't have those elaborate cutouts. It's got a much simplified uh, arrangement there, but um, quite an quite an elegant looking loco actually. Yeah, certainly the the they're very pretty, and uh, there were a, another further development of that nine one zero with smaller driving wheels, uh, more or less identical, but smaller wheels, and they called it a 1440 class. Yeah, but, this yeah. one's got seven, seven foot drivers, apparently. Yeah, yeah. And the, 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 the leading axle, the leading wheel is four foot six, which is rather large, isn't it, for a, for, for a, for a, for a 240. Yeah, well, the the larger the front wheels they could get away with, the, the probably the better it rode. Mm. Uh, yes. But the, the, the North East and, and the, the, the many 240s, many different kinds, and they were all rebuilt and improved upon, altered, and uh, the, the development just went on and on. Uh, that, the one Nigel's building, the, the Jinx's baby, is, uh, is one of the earlier ones. Uh, and uh, it'll be a lovely locker when it's done, I am absolutely sure. Have you just yours going to be, it, is yours going to be painted like this, Nigel? Is that the kind that's, of scheme? Uh, that's an, approxima an, an approximation of delivery, yeah. Um, Either that or like the um, s and long boiled loco that is in the museum at uh, Darlington, in the North Road Museum, not 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 the uh, yeah in the, in the Darlington North Road Museum. So it's a very similar livery. You can see how complicated it is. Um, I don't relish the thought of painting it myself. I was just commenting on the fact that this one has the simplified cutouts on the splasher. Yes, indeed. Um, and actually, I was told that Robin emailed me last night and said, I'm bored because he's, he's building coaches like mad, ready for his uh, um, evening with. There's a little plug there, evening with Robin Taylor on the 26th of this month. 26th of March. Yeah, so he and but he said he was bored, and, and he said I've started building a a, a nine oh one. I think everybody starts, says, "Oh, he's doing a two four oh. I'm going to do a two four oh as well." 
So, um, so Robbins, I think, is building a, a 901 at the moment. I think he's started it. Knowing the way that he builds, it will be finished by the end of next week. He, he did tell me that he was expecting to see the loco running this evening, but or by the by, by the close of play this afternoon. I think. So shall, we, shall we come back to you, Nigel? Have you have you done what you were disappearing into the I kitchen have, to do? I've, um, it's sticked in the in this. The letter. Yeah, well, sorry, I, my come here. In, we've got another modeler in the family. Say hello. Hello. Right. He's building, what are you bit making? Um, vampire. Well, tell them. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. He's building a vampire and he's, he's got that right. So what you need to do, Patrick, is you need to get some tape, which I gave you there, wrap it round and tight so that it's going to stick. Oh, I'll do it because it'll be quicker. I'll do this one and you can do the next one. Okay. okay. I know. Because I need to do Why does it need to do that? Because it needs to stick. Because it needs to stick. Sorry about this. this. Vampire, has this vampire got blood on its teeth? Dougie wants to know, has the vampire got blood on its teeth? Uh, they just, they just paint it. They just paint it. There you go. So you need to put it on the front as well. On the front. Uh, yes. Okay. Um, yes, yeah, so I'll... I've been to uh, I've been into the kitchen. Jana's just got home, so uh, actually I didn't get into trouble, so that was quite good. But I've I've, sp <laughs> I've split them, so now we've got two identical frames, but they of course they are fairly filthy. So I'm uh, I'm going to just give them a quick rub down and get rid of the uh, solder. So we've got a nice space to work on and see what we've got to, to build the rest of the locomotive. Yeah, well done. Now we just have a new key. In my experience, uh, Nigel, if you're going to use the kitchen for anything other than cooking, um, one of the golden rules is to make sure that you remove all traces of solder from the cooker. Yeah because it can lead to all sorts of problems. What, life problems or food poisoning problems? No comment. No comment. I, um, I have the pleasure, of this, my, one of my hobbies is keeping the, the, the gas hob clean. So, um, you've got your hand right in the middle of the Oops. thing there. there you go. And a knife. A knife? Yes. Where are you? This is my knife. That's his knife, apparently. Um, so, as you can probably guess, I'm a big advocate for children having a hobby. So, rather than him playing on the Xbox all the time, he's uh, he's doing some uh, some modeling. What are you looking for? That wood. The wood you give me. That's here. <laughs> Sorry, folks. There you go. Do you recognise that, Douglas? <laughs> Jig for P2 loco body. Um, one of Dougie's kits came with some very, very nice uh, high-grade um, plywood, which is this. And uh, I don't know. It's um, it's, it's really good. So I call it a Dunhill block. Because Nick Dunhill, when he's uh, when he's doing all of his uh, um, modelling and demonstrations, you see this this cheese bit of cheese. It looks like it's got so many holes in it. So, what stage are we at now, then, Nigel? You've got the two frames separated, right, and so you're obviously frames, cleaning them up. Frames separated. My intention is to join the frames together at the rear of the locomotive. Is uh, is that is that box that, uh, that which is which was a tank that was used to store the water or to transport the water from the tender before it entered into the um, into the boiler, and I'm going to use that or part of that as the structure to hold together the um, hold hold the frames together. So. The overall width of the frames is 26 millimetres. 
but um, this was the original, these were the original uh, frame spaces. Um, they were far too, far too narrow for what I wanted them for. Um, the inside space is 22 and uh, it's about 24 and a half mil, I think it is, um, for the centres. So this is one of the spaces I've made. And that will sit in here, like so. Um, behind it will be the will be the the, uh, uh, the firebox, which will ex which extends down beneath the frames, and in front of it, of course, is you're going to have all the valve gear. I haven't decided whether I'm going to make working valve gear or not. Um, I don't know. I, I think you should. I think I should, but it's 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 all about time, isn't it? Um, at the uh, at the back of the frame, at the bottom, I've made a a little notch there, and I'm going to insert a another another cross member there, um, and that will obviously I'll just file it flush, so you won't be able to see it, um, and and of course there's going to be a footstep going up into the cab in front of it anyway, so you won't be able to see it. Oh, another member of the Keith, the 7mm group has joined, Mr. Scarborough, good morning, sir. Um, so, some people seem to use, I've put it down, I don't know where it is, some people seem to use those frame spaces with the, you know, which are about, I don't know, quarter square, and, uh, I always look at it. Oh, here's one from the old from the old model. And I always look at it and I go, it doesn't look like the real thing. I've been underneath steam locos and I've never seen a great big quarter inch square block of of, uh, of of brass or steel or anything. So what I've decided to do um, in this build is is I will I will try and make some proper frame um, spaces for it. The strength of it, the back. There'll be the back. Let's use a pointer. There'll be one going running horizontally here. There'll be one. Do it this way. You can see it a bit better. One horizontally here. One sitting vertically vertically here. I think there's going to be. Well, there will be some apparatus at the front there. So in this point here, it will be where this water pump assembly will be, driving off the valve gear. It'd be nice to make it work, wouldn't it? We'll see. And then and then obviously just in front of the axle, probably starting around about here, will be the smoke box. So and, and obviously the cylinders will be down underneath here. So there'll be two great big well, there'll be a you know for strength, there'll be a massive assembly there. Um, and then probably something running across the top of here above, you know, at the end supporting the buffer beam and all the rest. So, so we'll see. So it should be strong enough. So, why do people put these quote, these great big square spaces in? I've just chucked away. What did I do with it? I think the answer to that, Nigel, is uh, convenience and quickness. So, uh, when, when it comes to the uh, when it when it comes to working valve you, you can defer that decision until much later, till you've got a lot more of it done and then you can decide how much space you've got and yeah. whether you want to bother or not. Yeah. Um, I, would, I would defer that decision. Yeah, it's whether it's whether you can see it as well. I, um, I did that uh, 440. Um, I did a, built a Northeastern 440, which, which, um, which Warren... Oh, what's his surname? Warren. Warren Warren. Sorry, Warren. Painted for me. What's his name? Warren Haywood. Haywood. I was thinking Shepherd, and I know that's not right. Mr. Haywood. No. Um, and he did a beautiful job of painting the model. And now that it's finished, and when I run it on the on my rolling road, is that you see everything wibbling up and down and it looks fine. But would you actually see anything in a in a space which is probably about that wide, and in and in, and in front of it there is um, there is some 
paraphernalia in front of it as well. So it might be a point of just making dummy valve gear in there and just not bothering. I don't know. Maybe I have little pieces now. So, uh, does anybody else here scratch build or are you, are you buying kits or what's the thing? What, are there any messages here? No, I've just put a I've just put a note on. Anybody got any questions for Nigel? They're all sitting there, obviously, totally enthralled by what you're doing, Nigel. And uh... <laughs> yeah, enthralled or bored. Uh, this is one of those things where um, I got to quarter quarter to one this morning with this uh, with this frame, and I thought I really should go to bed. And I was going to I was going to carry on first thing this morning, but uh, all sorts going on here. There's um, a, dump of snow last night, cats at the vet, just came back a few minutes ago, um, and there's skiing going on at Yasna, which is it's the World Skiing Championships, and our local heroine um, went down, she went down first and she was in first place, so what can I say? Um, so Slovakia is on, riding high, but um, it doesn't help with the cleaning up frames. It's right. just so heavy. Nigel, the, the, the story with the name of Jinx's baby. Yes. Uh, it, com it comes from the, the, the story, as you said, by Edward Jenkins. Yes. Which was a political comment on the poor law reform. And Mr. Jinx were a very impoverished labourer. And he already had 12 kids. That's right. <laughs> he'd, he'd had a set of twins and a set of triplets and a lot of singles. And he, he had a total of 12 and his, his wife announced the 13th on its way. <laughs> and he threatened, he says, I, he says, I cannot afford to keep it. He says, I, I'm struggling to keep the ones I've got. He says, so if we have any more, I'm going to drown it. So, when the baby's born, he takes hold of the baby and he's threatening to throw it off the, uh, the, um, so the bridge in London. Right. He's, on, he's on his way with the baby in his arms and all the neighbours are following him, carrying on, saying, you can't do that, you're a murderer, you know. <laughs> and he, he gets near to the bridge and he bumps into a nun coming the other way. Um, the nun offers to take it off him, so he, he's highly delighted, gives it to the nun, and he's glad to see the back of the baby, and the nun has it away into the local convent or, or Catholic church. There you go. But his wife was a Protestant, <laughs> and she didn't, she didn't like this idea. And she went down to, to feed the baby in the convent, and... They, they wouldn't let her feed him unless they, they crossed her breast with the sign of Christ, you know, all, all this business, and she wouldn't have it, and they were hell on. <laughs> Hilarious. Yeah, so it's just a bit I read earlier this evening, I thought that might just uh, shine a light on why it would call a Jinx's baby, because he couldn't get rid of the problems with the valve gear. Yeah, so I think I think I, I still can't work out what, what the connection is with between the problems that uh, that Bush had with this loco and the, and the novel. But it's a good story. It's a good name for a loco as well, you know. It's uh, yeah, rather than S and D long boiled or or whatever you want to call it. Well, in answer to your My question, in answer to your your question, Nigel, does anybody out there do any? Scratch building. Simon yeah. Hill has just just replied. Yes, he does. I don't know whether Simon, you want to tell us what you've ever uh, tackled anything quite as uh, well. Shall we say unusual as as this model? Yeah, I did a Sterling single uh, probably about twenty years ago. Well, I actually done three of them. One for a customer, one for me, and a spare set. 
and just thinking about what you showed earlier with a set of um, splashers. That was the original splasher I cut just to test out the theory. Hmm. And did you do that by drill, drilling a series of holes and then slotting them all together and no, no, that's lots done of filing? And I, I tend to use machinery to do a lot of the cutting, so that was done on a pantograph engraver. All oh, right, okay. What can I say? I'm not allowed a pantograph engraver in my in, in the office here. <laughs> well, well, you can always ask. There's, there's always plenty of people in the guild that do a bit for you. I'm not averse to doing a few bits of cutting every now and then. Well, yeah. I've done yeah I, I, I can go one step further. I have a, a CNC routing machine, um, which would do a job like that in about 10 minutes. Yeah. But, uh, you know, it's arguable whether that's that comes within the realms of um, model making. You know, there's this, there's always this okay. argument as to whether, as to what extent you should use machinery. All of it. I think the key is with any scratch building is if you do the entirety of it, whether you're drawing a file to transfer to a machine or like me going to a drawing board to create a drawing to make a pattern for the engraver or as same as doing any pattern work for castings, that is still yeah. scratch building. Yeah. Gary, were you going to say something then? Yeah. Um, I'm just looking at um, Nigel cleaning up his uh, the chassis. I'm not sure whether you can, I'm just going to get a piece of paper so I can show you that. Uh, where am I? Okay. I don't know whether you can see that. That's called a spider. And I use that for cleaning up. And it's, it goes in my Dremel. And it's a, I, I don't know whether squires would have them, but probably from my accent, you realise that I'm about 14,000 kilometres away. Where's my, there we are. That's, that's a right. doggy. So it's a bit like that. Yeah, there, that's the one. Uh, is yeah. that is that yeah that's uh, that's a metal one is it it's a metal one i was i was uh, debating what to whether to do that or not with a dremel um i didn't know whether you guys would appreciate me going oh no no that's just that's just being an efficient scratch builder that's it that's all yeah 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 so um i've got this to a reasonable point now so you so you uh, asked uh, me if i'm a scratch builder and I am a scratch builder, what and this is uh, part of my latest offering. And I got my 3D printer out after two years and just printed this loco body out. And there's the foot plate. And there is the chassis. And it's unconventional. Walking outside the square, And the chassis is actually PCB. And I used those square pieces like you had, Nigel, yeah. to separate it before I put the spaces in. I well, used it as a, as, like as a jig before. Uh... Yeah. yeah. That's a good idea. Yeah. And just while I got, the, got them on, this is uh, for a Kaylee 123. And this is my chassis. Again, PCB and a homemade gearbox mm. and that runs as smoothly as can that runs as smoothly as can be that's good that's and if good. you guys have heard of david halliwell he was the one that put me onto it so each time i come to the uk to visit my family i end up at telford or doncaster or somewhere and uh catch up with a few guys like david halliwell and robbie pullman okay so i'll be here for probably another half an hour it's starting to get a bit late here <laughs> and you had snow. Well, we were 31 degrees here today. It was bloody hot. There you go. Uh, are you, are you, whereabouts are you? I'm in Queensland. In Queensland. Yeah. Yeah. I'm 200 um, kilometres outside of Gympie, uh, outside of Brisbane, in Gympie. Fantastic. So we've got people from all over. Kerry mentioned uh, the use of printed circuit board. Um, I have to say that that is a very useful medium. I used it a lot in the kits that I used to produce. Um, you can get it in a variety of thicknesses and a variety of thicknesses of copper. Um, it has uh, several advantages in that you can solder to it, obviously. It, it, it is dimensionally stable. Um, the only difficulty when using it, well, two things actually, you have to be careful when you're using it. Um, 
strictly speaking, in, in, in industrial use, you, you're supposed to wear all sorts of face, face protection and so on because it contains um, fiberglass. Well, so one, one, one brand actually contains fiberglass. And when you're drilling and filing it and machining it, it gives off a fine dust, which is not only an irritant, but it's also very nasty if you happen to breathe it in. Um, another, another disadvantage of it is that because it contains fiberglass, it doesn't do your saws and drills much good. And you certainly don't want to be cutting it on a guillotine. It'll blunt guillotine blades in five seconds flat. Really? But otherwise, it's a very, very useful um, um, medium. Dave, I was very interested that you have a CNC. I've just purchased a CNC machine. We're going to have to learn how to use it. The idea was to work it, cut, cut out, not with the laser, but with the bit, my uh, sachassis. That was the idea behind. I've got several, I've got heaps of things in the pipeline, mm -hmm. including this 3D printing stuff, which I'm really catching, catching up with. Well, they're, they're quite easy to learn to use. Um, one, of the, one, of the, one of the basic things is that you must always remember to allow for the diameter of the cutter. And when you're, when you're cutting out, shall we say, a hole, you, you must remember to tell the machine that you're cutting on the inside of the, of the drawing and not the outside. Otherwise, you end up with a hole which is not only the diameter of the hole, but plus the diameter of the cutter as well. <laughs> I've made many a mistake like that, but uh, you know, you, you get you soon get used to it. Okay, thank you. So, do you you got a, a 3D printer, Kerry? What uh, what sort of printer have you got? Is it one using what? one of the fi um, a fiber, or, or is it a, a resin based one? No, no, it's it's a fiber. It's a Aldi, uh, which in actual fact here in Australia is called Cocoon Create. Uh, but it's a Wanho out of China. And in the UK, when Audi sold them, they've got another name. It starts with a B, but I've forgotten what it is. I got it for my 80th birthday, but I couldn't. I tried to learn shape, uh, um, SketchUp, but I couldn't get to it. So I put it away and I suddenly got onto this idea of looking at Thingiverse, which has some free um, STL files. And in that process, a guy in the two mill group posted up on the, one of the forums that he had a London, Chatham and Dover uh, tank loco that uh, he'd drawn up and he was making the STL files available for free. So I sent him an email and I got it. They were actually two mil, but I printed it out at seven mil, went back to him. And he was absolutely delighted that somebody had picked up the file and actually printed a buy that wasn't too milf, but he was really tickled pink. So I've sent him up my updates and keeping him posted on it. But that's where it started. And I know that John Birch is uh, mooting to try to build up some sort of a means whereby people can swap STL files, but there's a problem in relationship to those that might abuse the system. Mm. If oh, there's John anyone Birch. else here... John Birch yeah. uh, acquired a, a CNC router from me, actually, but as, to my knowledge, he never actually got around to, eat, to, um, to using it. Um, I don't know whether he still got it, but um, he seems to have gone over to 3D printing now rather than uh, CNC routing. Well, my routers, my units come with a laser, which I really wasn't going to be fussed with because I could imagine all the rubbish coming off a PCB board with a laser. But on reflection, um, I might try and use it to do some buildings. That seems mm. to be the, the best way to use the router in terms of model railway is for your buildings and structures. Uh, I'm more of a builder. I've done heaps of coaches, lots of uh, uh, rail cars, and uh, now I'm in the scratch building of locos. Uh, I haven't got much to show you guys here because it's up in the shed. Um, but I counted up the other day. Uh, I've done uh, nearly 120 coaches of various types. I started out, I started first by doing a, um, a plastic card coach. I never got it finished because I realized how stupid I would be. Put it on my garden rail for five minutes and they'd be all warped in our heat. So I built a lot of coaches using aluminium shells. And then I got onto casting and molding 
and uh, casting pieces. And uh, initially, it was fiberglass resin and a um, M MEK uh, additive. But that was pretty dangerous stuff. But we've moved on now. In Australia, we have a thing called pinky seal, which you can use and make a mould for polyurethane casting and also for white metal. And if I showed you my white metal spinner, you'd all die. It's actually an X final turntable. <laughs> Rigged really up with a with with a with a switch a dimmer switch on it to control the speed. Anyway, back to you, Nigel. And uh, you you seem to be polishing away there. You you'll have this thing I'm, you'll have I this thing put together by the end of the session, won't you? It, well, I hope I was hoping to. What time does this finish? Half an hour. Um, eleven o'clock. This this particular session. Then you're on again this afternoon. Right. So um, shiny, shiny. So I'm going to use. What, um, what me method of soldering are you going to be using on that? Are you going to be using a torch or an iron? I resistance. Will either be using a soldering iron. Or I will be using, oh, I have to sharpen it up. I, I might use the, the, is it? I might use the resistance sign. Um, I haven't really thought about that. I think I'll use, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to fit the, um, oh, it's quite useful, this pointer. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to fit the home box in before I, before I join it, because I think it might be easier that way. So I will, uh, I'll probably use the resistance side. Sorry, there's a cap going off in the background. I don't know if you can hear it. He's, uh, he's back from the vet and I think he's telling everybody how peed off he is. <laughs> um, I'll see a comment here from Simon who says that he, he, he uses uh, Scotch-Brite for cleaning up. I've used Scotch-Brite, but I tend to, I find that it tends to fall to pieces when you, particularly yes. if, you're, if you're using it on something which has got loads of holes and edges in it. Have you tried using the mops that are available from Scotch Bright? They come in free grade, fine, medium, and coarse. They don't oh, right. last long, but for taking solder off like he's taking off there, that would do it probably in a minute. Yeah. Yeah. I um, never come across those. Um, Jan L do them. They're about a pound, pound each. Mm hmm. Nigel, for cleaning up something uh, like your frames there, I, I normally start off with a wood chisel. Lay it down flat, get the thick of the solder off with a wood chisel, and then you move on to your fiberglass or your scotch bright to clean it up further. But the, the, the wood chisel gets the bulk of it off. Yes, you could probably do it with a... And I'm going to wings that. Knife as well. But actually there isn't there isn't really that much solder on this. There is a bit here, it's pulled it. Um, I what I'm gonna do, because I've cleaned it, I'm gonna use yeah. <laughs> I could decide which side to have these on. I could I could have it have it this way around. But for the sake of our demonstration, if I put it, if I make it this way around with the with the yucky bit on the outside still showing, I can clean that up afterwards. Um, whereas the inside of it is going to be a bit of a bit of a devil. So I think shall we start and see if we can assemble something? We've got four cats in this house. Every one of them is a character. And I've got one now, because the sun, it's nearly lunchtime. It's, it's nearly, it's what, 20 to 12. The sun's coming round here. And I'm gonna to have to close down the blinds in front of the thing, or kick the cat out. Um, because she goes after all the sparkly, um, sparkly reflections on the wall. And of course, with what I'm doing, there's gonna be lots of them. Right. Do you use any form of big or fixture to 
when you're assembling the frames to ensure that you get them square and parallel and um, on? I will be I will be mainly using a uh, series of squares. Where is it? These need a these need a clean up. They've had a bit of a bit of use recently, and I've got an aluminium base to um, to because I can put it on. The problem is, of course, is that where is how how we're going to where am I going to put it to to see how it, how it's sitting to make it square that way? I don't know. Um, I am relying on on the accuracy of my drawing on that bit of. Um, um, why don't you put it through here? Well, that's a good point. My son is. Why don't I put it through there? <laughs> maybe that, maybe that's the way to do it. Um, but the graph, if the drawings on the graph paper is right, and, 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 and the way I've designed it is right, then hopefully, when we also take into account the uh, the way that the um, um, the horn, the horn blocks will work, the compensation, it will take up a little bit of the slack. But I think that it's going to be uh, a case of test and try and test and test again. Just cleaning up the edges in here before we, oh, before we assemble it. This is a Slater's sprung horn block assembly. I don't, I think they still make them, but the design might have changed because this design's about 20 years old. But one thing I do like about it is it's made from nickel silver. And I thought I mentioned about this. If you're a scratch building, if you can get nickel silver instead of, and use nickel silver instead of brass, it's a hell of a lot easier. Um, it's easier to cut. I think there are different hardnesses of nickel silver, of course, but um, I think it's easier to cut and it's certainly easier to solder. Nickel silver is a wonderful material. I don't know why people make kits out of, design kits and make them out of etched brass, then etched nickel would be a lot better. Well, I know a bit about nickel silver, um, Nigel, and the, the grade that normally available to model makers is 10% nickel which is a very uh, um, it's a nice color um, it's easy to work yes it also has the advantage it doesn't tarnish like brass so you can put your work down and come back to it a couple of days later and you, you don't have tarnished fingerprints all over it you're not forever cleaning it up it does tend to stay um, yeah, you know, fairly fairly bright. A bit more expensive, but I think uh, you know, nicer to work with. I, I find wobbly bit. Brass tarnished, nickel silver like new. Yeah, right. Yeah. Paint tends to stick to nickel silver a bit better as well. That's true. Yeah. Yeah, Warren told me that. So he, like, he, like, he likes painting. Uh, he likes painting nickel silver models. So uh, yeah. Now, Ian's just come up with a um, a remark here, which he says that he assembled his frames with a pair of temporary brass spacers screwed in, and then when everything's all nice and square, you can then solder in your permanent uh, plate spacers in. Yes. Um, and then, then afterwards, you you fill in and fill in the screw holes or, you know, to disguise them. Another idea that somebody came up with recently was get a couple of blocks of uh, pieces of wood, preferably rather than plastic, um, which are exactly the same thickness as the space between your frames. Place yep. them between the frames and then using these little, you can get these little miniature ratchet clamps, grip the, grip the two frames together with the uh, piece of wood sandwich between them. And that then holds everything in place whilst you, whilst you put your stretches across, hold your stretches. That would work. Yeah, I think everybody has their own particular techniques for doing these things. 
I think I think so. Um, one thing I'm finding with with this, as I found with the last with the last demo that I did, is that you when you're when you're demonstrating, you are sort of like multitasking. My wife would be brilliant at doing this, but um, yeah, yeah, yes, yeah, it's Patrick. Because um, but no. I I don't uh, you know. I would probably would spend more time thinking about how best to do this. Um, but I'm always up for a challenge. So uh, do it that way. Right, so what I've done is, recognize that David, still using it. <laughs> I'm going to tin this frame from the inside. Go down! It's very lightly. Cat's been evacuated. Oh, not evacuated, been evicted from the office now. Right. So this goes like this. Why are you going quiet? So is this a resistant soldering? Um, this is a resistant soldering iron. So I thought I'd just do a quick resistance soldering iron demonstration. That's what you'd call an interference fit, isn't it? What's the big question? Gulp. Is whether this is going to slide inside. Oh, it's a bit tight. Don't have it too tight, Nigel, or it'll bend your frames. <laughs> yeah, that's right, Dougie. Can't be that far off, actually. Once, uh, once the horn, horn blocks are in and the, um, and the bearings are installed, I will be mainly using one of these. Um, I'm not going to pee on Mr. Poppy's bonfire because I think he's doing a demonstration of this unit, either as we he speak is, yeah. or afternoon. Yeah, this afternoon. But all yep. I have to okay. do I can tell you when it is. He will be giving this demonstration at half past one GMT. Right. He's in the middle of your demonstration, Nigel, so, you know. I don't think I'm going to be on, looking at the speed that things are going along. I don't think I'm going to be there, be ready for it. But um, anybody building, scratch building, and wanting to get their... Um, uh, Get, get everything nice and square and and obviously the the uh, coupling rods and everything absolutely spot on i can't recommend this too much i've i've the last actually the last local built was a single so that doesn't really count but but probably the last three locos i've built i've used this and it look at his demonstration i know it's taking people away from my demonstration. But, but look at the demonstration from, because it's a really, really good unit. It's a really good idea. Um, normally, I, I, and I was checking it on the, on the original model that I was building, the original Jinx's baby that I was working on, and um, it was still tight. It was still tight, even after 20 years of sitting in the cupboard. I don't know why, nothing has changed, but, um, I think if I use this, if I use this system, 
it's going to be an absolute joy. Um, it should be really, really simple and easy to do. Right. Final, final try. There, look at that. That's better. Can you see that? It's very difficult to show. I might solder it in place first, but that wobbles up and down now, so um, I will... Ready? No, Patrick, I'm working, so... Oh. <laughs> right. Resistant soldering. An alternative to to using one of these. Um, I think once you've had a resist have a resistant soldering iron and uh, and are used to using it, you'll never turn back. Um, these soldering these soldering irons are great for applying solder. Of course they are, but the problem is is that solder goes everywhere, and you spend most of your life cleaning up solder. Whereas using a resistance iron, um, I'm doing this using, uh, using a rod of solder, but you can also use it using uh, solder paste. But using a resistance iron is, it's virtually clean up free. You don't need to spend all your time trying to, I need your help. trying to clean it up and tidy it up. So, yeah. Excuse me a second. I can't help. You, you work it out yourself and I'll be with you in about 15 minutes, okay? Right, folks, so. Obviously got to remember, Nigel, that there's an inside and an outside on the frame when you're working, so. Uh... <laughs> yeah, and of course you, you solder, solder the compensation unit on all the horn blocks on both on the same side. And then you will be uh, cursing yourself. Uh, the reason why I'm fiddling around between my legs is on the floor, if people aren't aware of how resistance solving irons work, there is a negative. This version, which I like, I, I don't understand people soldering on, onto a steel block um, with these resistance irons, but there is a wooden block covered in in aluminium foil. The turkey foil is better. I can't, I live in Slovakia, so the foil that we get here is really thin stuff for wrapping food. But the big turkey foil, which is a lot thicker, um, is better. It covers this wooden block, so you've got a solid surface to solder onto. On the floor, there is a transformer unit with a three stage transformer. So you can get three, three three resistances or three levels of heat and there's a push button so to demonstrate the push button no no push button push button you see it sparking um mm. put the job on the uh, on the wooden on the wooden board with the aluminium um and press down i'm now making a circuit making a very good circuit why isn't you doing that let's have a look here there we go. Ready? The solder has flowed. I and the stuff and the two parts have now come together. Patrick, I'll be with you in a few minutes, yeah? If I bend the glue. The advantage of using an aluminium foil, of course, is that the solder can't, you can't actually stick anything to it, you can't solder to it. Exactly. Um, and the advantage of, of resistant soldering is with a normal soldering iron, you, with the resistant soldering, you can heat it up and you take your, by, and you heat it up by making a circuit on a push button and you can leave the probe in place while the job cools down. So uh, there we go. And
It was so nice at first. I think there's some solar flowed inside here. It just needs cleaning up a bit. Um, well, problem with using no, Nigel and everybody, we've we've got four minutes left on this session. Okay. Um, as I'm sure everybody will have found out that Nigel is coming back again at one o'clock this afternoon to continue. Um, so anybody that uh, wants to come and join us again this afternoon, we'd like to see you. That you guys in Australia, I suppose you'll be far to sleep by then. Dougie will stay up late. He's a night owl. <laughs> Um, no, I will be sound asleep and I will be snoring, but I'll be out of bed about half past five. Say again, Doug. I'll probably stop up to watch you if I can. <laughs> oh, there you go. Um, so it's now 11 o'clock. It's 12 o'clock my time. So it's time for me to have a bit of soup and, uh, and a bit of lunch. I might, if I, what time are we back, Dave? In an hour, is it? We're, we're back at, hang on, let me, let me consult the timetable. We are back at 1300 GMT, so midday for you, is it, out there? 1300, that's two o'clock. Really? 1300, that's two o'clock. I might actually uh, Sorry, move yes, this a bit, so when you come back, you might actually see, have something to look at. <laughs> so I'll, I'll do my best. Um, so it's at 1300 GMT. Yep. Right, so, so that means we've got two hours. Yeah, it's two hours from now, Nigel. Yep, yep. There we go. Well, um, so thank, thanks, thanks for your session this morning, Nigel, and uh, thanks everybody for joining in. Um, we've had an average of 20, uh, 27 people all morning, so you know, oh. you've, so. you've kept their attention. Somewhat, and no doubt some of you will be back this afternoon. I hope. I hope we you might will. have some new faces. I hope you will. Um, one thing I found about scratch building is that it's it, it can be a slow process. So I am sorry if it's not moved on as quickly and as fast as people would uh, would expect. Um, scratch building is also a, th a silent occupation. Where, where the grey matter is working away all the time. It certainly is for me. Um, so it's not the easiest of not not the easiest of things. But um, I hope that you've maybe learned something, uh, something a new skill or something. Uh, I hope that it encourages you all to go and do some modelling and enjoy. And so it. It's only taken you twenty years to get get it to this stage, so that's not bad going. I know. <laughs> I I think I can't remember exactly what Dougie said about this, but I think it was, can you finish it before I've gone? <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yeah, the, the, so this will be this year's project. This will be, um, uh, will be up and running in a couple of months, I guess. I Luna! intend to put some, send some photographs and a short article into the Gazette. Um, so at least people can see some of the, the finished, um, finished articles that, I, that I've started. Thank you for that. Uh, and, uh, we'll take it from there. Right. Okay, we'll see you later then, um, yeah, Nigel. Cheers. See you later on. Cheers, Kerry. Thank you. Sleep well. Thank you. <laughs> and uh, I'll speak to you later, Dougie. And, uh, yeah. Catch you later, Nigel. And just take Patrick down to Vauxhall Bridge. <laughs> <laughs> He doesn't understand. <laughs> we'll see you later. See, see you guys later on. Have a enjoy have it, a, enjoy it, Nige. Good. You are the one. That's great. That's good. So thank you, everybody, and uh, thank you to David and Charles for and Dougie for uh, for coming in here. Oh look, <laughs> might <laughs> struggle to join you later, Nigel. I've got other things on today. I will if I can. Right. No worries, Charles. All the best. Keep in touch. Yep. Yeah, take care. So. Bye. <laughs> there you Thanks, go. Charles. I'm saying to Dad to have a break. You're saying to me to have a break from right. the television, from so, this, from this. Yeah.
Well, you can sit here next time. Go on, you come on. No. Get in here. No. Get in here. No. <laughs> oh, we've we've Robin to watch next. <laughs> is, is Robin Robin starting now? Is he? No, in uh, about an hour and a quarter. All right. So, so yeah, Robin Robin starts at twelve fifteen. Right. GMT. Yeah. Showing you how to build line side cottages. I told you it was cottagey. <laughs> Daddy, this was heavy. That was difficult. But, yeah. I didn't for know. the benefit of everybody who's still still listening or watching in, um, all these sessions are being recorded and they will be available to re to to view uh, again or any that you you know you've missed. Um, they'll be available from the Guild's website from tomorrow, I, I, I guess. I think, I think the last time we managed to get all the recordings processed, well, certainly by the Monday, so, um, you know, I'll be able to uh, have a, have a have replay of everything that, uh, that's been going on today. There's all the layout videos, of course, which, are, which, which will be on. And... Um, the uh, other sessions, you know, all, all the sessions are being recorded anyway, so you shouldn't miss out. I, I'm, I'm given to understand that if you were to watch all the layout videos, there's a total of something like 27 hours. So if you want to binge watch the layout, that's how long it's going to take. Be quite good. I, I, I had a look at a lot of them after, uh, after the last uh, virtual event. Learned a lot about... 3D printing and, and all the rest of it. So it can become highly recommended. So. Right, well, I'm going, to I'm going to close this session down now because I need to get prepared for the next one. Jolly good. Thank you, David. So we, we shall see you, Nigel, and any others who are uh, coming back this afternoon. We shall see you later. Bye-bye. Bye. Patrick. Bye. Bye, Patrick. Cheers. See you all later. Have a good, have a good afternoon.